analogy, and we like to root for an underdog. And, and I remember one of my favorite sports um, moments in, in Southern California. In fact, and if you're a Dodger fan, it was voted as the favorite sports moment in Dodger history. A lot of great sports moments in Dodger history, but it was 1988. The Dodgers and the Oakland A's were in the World Series. The first game of the, of the World Series was here in Legion Park in Southern California, Dodger Stadium. And they were the underdogs. Uh, the A's were, were favored to win the series. They, they were the team that year. The Dodgers finally made it into the World Series. And you thought, okay, you know, if you're a Dodger fan, you're kind of used to disappointment. But so we are always the underdogs, it feels like. You can do it. Ah, oh, maybe next year. You know, but they were in the World Series, first game of the World Series, and they're in, entering the bottom of the ninth, the Dodgers' last at bat, and they're down by one run. And their star player, Kirk Gibson, didn't even play that game because he had a, both, both legs were hurt on one knee and the other other foot was, was hurt, so he was, didn't even suit up for the beginning of the game. Here they are, the bottom of the ninth, one man on. They're down by one, one run. There's two outs, and they need a pinch hitter. So they, who do they call as a pinch hitter? Well, if you know the story, they call Kirk Gibson, who was down in the workout room just warming up and getting ready just in case. He can barely walk, much less run, but he thought maybe he could be a pinch, pinch hitter. They put Kurt Gibson in, who was the best player on the team, um, fielder on the team that year, hit 25 home runs and all-star, MVP, that kind of a year. But here he is, not hardly able to walk. He comes up at the bottom of the ninth, and the count goes to full count. Three balls and two strikes, two outs. I mean, this is like the Casey, Casey at bat, right? It was one of those things. And you just think, if you're a Dodger fan, you think, well, we tried. You know, we, we tried. And then the last pitch, Kurt Gibson leans over the plate and swings a, le- a lefty. He was lefty. And it didn't even look like he hit the ball hard, but the ball ends up in the right field stands. There's a home run. The, Dodgers win the game, the first game of the World Series. They go on to win the series. The momentum of that game kept them going throughout the World Series. They won the World Series. In fact, there was so much noise when Kurt Gibson hit that home run that uh, Kay and I were um, living in Echo Park at the time, about a mile from the stadium. We could see the stadium from our apartment building, and the noise continued for a good five minutes. It just was nonstop. It was this this roar that wouldn't, wouldn't go away. And it was so exciting because the underdog, the underdog team, the underdog player came from behind, and everyone loves an underdog. And this morning, I'm here to tell you about the greatest underdog of all time. <laughs> you know, when, when the nation of Israel was looking for a Messiah, they were looking for the promised Savior who would come. They were looking for a strong king probably a political figure, but someone who was um, dynamic and strong and maybe was very wealthy, someone who would con- conquer. Maybe he was going to be a warrior king. He could conquer the Roman Empire who was oppressing the Jews. And they were looking for a, a certain kind of king. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, he didn't fit any of those prerequisites, didn't fit their mold of what the king would be. Jesus was the ultimate underdog. Before Jesus even was born, he was prophesied to be born in Bethlehem. And when the three kings came, or the wise men, I don't know if they're three or not. When they came to Bethlehem looking, they talked to Herod. They says, where's the king born? And Herod got freaked out. He said, oh, he's, tell me when you find out where he is. I want to worship him too. But really, Herod made, a, made an agreement. He made an agreement with the devil. He didn't even know it. It was to kill all the male boys two years and younger in the city of Bethlehem who were born. He wanted to snuff out. The devil wanted to snuff out Jesus before he even got started, but Jesus did survive. His parents took him to Egypt, and a couple years later, they brought him back to Nazareth. When he grew up, and before he ever did a miracle, before he ever did any kind of public ministry, The very first thing he did, well, he got baptized, and then he went into the wilderness. 
The Bible says, and we'll see it in, in Matthew chapter 4, that he, was, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And there was something that happened with this encounter that, with the devil that solidified who Jesus was, who, what he was about, and what it was that was going to make him the king, the real king, the promised one, the one who would crush the head of the devil, the Messiah, the anointed one, who would heal the sick and raise the dead, the suffering servant who would shed his own blood for the sins of the world, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who would be the king over all kings, the son of man, the one who would be born a man to be the king of all man, that Jesus. And he met with the devil. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and following. It says this, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, by the way, this is what the devil will do. He, he will tempt you. He will test you. He will try to get you off track when you are in a place of weakness. He won't get you when you're in the middle of a church service. He'll get you when you're alone. He'll get you when you're tired, when you went through a sickness, when, you, when you're maybe facing unemployment, when your house is un, uh, it's in chaos. When you're weak, that's when the enemy's going to come. We're going to see this morning three things that characterize the leadership, that made Jesus the leader who he was. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The, one, the first principle is this. It's the principle of dependence. You see, Satan wanted Jesus to be independent. Hey, if you're hungry, just make your own bread. You can do it if you're really all that. You don't need anyone. You don't even need God. You could do it. Whatever you need, just go ahead and get it. That was the lie. Jesus said, man shall not live just by bread, but by everything that comes from God. He was talking about dependence, and he, and he was dependent. In John chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, Jesus said this, Truly, truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. You see, the, the greatest person who's ever lived in human history said, I can't do anything by myself. That seems like a point of weakness. That seems like, how could he be the king? He's so, he's needy. No, the needy and dependents are different. Jesus said this, he, I can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. Verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you'll be amazed. Again, in John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus said this, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. I'm doing what my father is speaking to me about. Again, in John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus said this, I did not speak of my own, but the father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm not doing anything. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not saying anything unless it first comes from him. That's totally dependent. He wasn't independent from the Father in any way. And Jesus calls us to a life of dependence. It's hard for Americans because we, we value independence so highly. We want to be self-starters and John Wayne and we can make it by ourselves. And, but that's not a Christian worldview. Here's what Jesus says in John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, were one, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you are nothing. You can do nothing. You're toast. Apart from me, there's nothing that you can really accomplish. Well, really nothing? I mean, I have something to give. If you're honest with yourself, you recognize that everything that you are, everything that you do comes from him. 
It's all from him. I like it in Colossians. It says, everything is held together by the power of his word. The very molecules in your body are held together right now by the power of Jesus. So we, can, we can't really say, oh, I'm all that. Or I have something by myself, on my own. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus told his disciples, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. In other words, he's saying, whatever you need, depend on him. Make sure he's first. Go to him for all your needs. The Apostle Paul writes about dependence. Philippians chapter 4, this, these are scriptures that you guys know. You've heard these scriptures, but it's good to be reminded of this because sometimes we, we wander on our own strength. We want to rely on the fact that we've done, been there and done that. And so we kind of get the self um, sense of confidence. The apostle says in Philippians 4.19, My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Everything that we need comes through our relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything. James the Apostle writes about dependence. Listen to what he says in James chapter 4. But listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. I'll tell you the truth. I, didn't, I didn't, had no idea that three weeks ago I was going to have a heart attack. Zero idea. In fact, some, some of my friends said, you're the healthiest person we know. <laughs> my God, sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> I didn't know. And you don't know what's happening tomorrow. You don't even know what's happening today. What is your life? You are a midst that appears, uh, midst that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. There's a friend of mine, and um, she's like a, she's a, a kind of a mother figure to me. And uh, I'll, I'll, when I say hi to her and I, I say goodbye, she'll always say, well, I'll say, see you next Sunday, because she comes to the church here. And I'll, I'll say, see you next Sunday. And she goes, if it's the Lord's will. I'm like, that's a good answer. Jesus lived by the principle of dependence. And he calls us to do the same. The second temptation in Matthew chapter 4, verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Nothing bad's ever going to happen to you. And Jesus answered him and said, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. The second principle, I believe, is the process of pain. You see, the, the Satan was trying to tell Jesus, you don't have to suffer pain. And he, you're the king of kings. You're all that in a bag of chips. You can do anything, and you don't ever have to suffer pain. I really think that Satan was tempting him that he didn't even have to go to the cross. He could just be a king on his own. Didn't need to suffer all the pain. He could insulate himself against pain. Isn't that what we try to do sometimes? Many times. We, we, want, it, we want the easy life. We don't want the pain. We don't want to have to go through the hassle, the struggle. Uh, you know, oh, yeah, I know. The caterpillar has to, you know, become the, you know, butterfly. And I know it's a struggle, but I'd rather not go there. Jesus could not insulate himself from pain. In fact, he could not become our high priest unless he knew every pain that we felt. Jesus would have had to suffer and die to become our Savior. He would have to be whipped, ridiculed, mocked, and despised. He wore a crown of thorns. His beard was pulled out. The hatred of the devil was unleashed on Jesus. The Old Testament says that when he was whipped, he would be marred more than any man. In Isaiah 53, now I want you to, I'm going to read it. This is an account of Isaiah talking about the, who the Savior would be, who, what would he, 
have to go through. This is a thousand years before Jesus. Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet never said a word. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shears, he didn't open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong. Listen, church, Jesus had done no wrong and suffered. You don't have to do wrong to suffer. Sometimes you're suffering and you're like, God, what did I do wrong? And it's not about what you did. It's the fact that you live in a broken world and that God is using it. I'm going I'm to talk in just a moment about our pain. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. He was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Why? So that he could be the Savior for us and know our every weakness and know our every temptation and know our every struggle. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so we can receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can go to Jesus with confidence because we know that he knows. You can go to a friend and tell him your problem, and they may or may not understand. Jesus will understand. He's been there. James chapter 1 talks about the pain that we go through. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything, and being conformed to the image of his son. That's the goal. Why do we have to suffer? A lot of times we think, man, suffering's not for me. I don't want to suffer. But it's necessary. It was necessary for Jesus, and it's necessary for us. Any gym rats in the room? Gym rats, raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand. I called her out. Come on. Yeah, gym rats. Loud and proud. Come on. Gym rats. You know that when you're working out, the goal is to put your body through such stress that you tear your muscles. They're they're microscopic tears in your muscles. And then after that, you sleep and get good nutrition and your body heals and your muscles become stronger and they're better suited now to take the crazy thing that you just did. So whether it's lifting weights or running, you can do it better because your muscles got strong. They had to get broken down, so to speak, before they would get stronger. And God wants us to be strong. The struggles we go through when we include our faith with grace end up making us stronger. And God wants an army of men and women who are strong in the Lord, who are overcomers, who are champions, more than conquerors in Christ. And for that, we have to go through pain. What made Jesus a different kind of a king? Well, the principle of dependency, the process of pain. And the third thing, the The third temptation in Matthew 4, verse 8, 
says this. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. By the way, that's before I'm not going to talk about this, but it's a great way whenever you're attacked by the enemy, just tell him to get out of there. I'm not going to hear you. I don't want to have any part of you. you. You don't have any part of me. Just get out. The scripture says, resist, resist the devil and he will flee. Put up some opposition. No, speak it out loud. Well, there's no one else in the house. doesn't matter. Just say it loud. Satan was offering Jesus something. He said, if you worship me, I'll give you everything. I'll put you at the top. I'll give you a position. You can be the ruler of all this. And it was Satan's to give. In fact, the New Testament even tells us that Satan is the God of this world. There will come a time when Jesus comes back and he will vanquish the enemy. He will tell him where to go. He'll bind him up. He'll be bound. He'll be thrown in hell. But until that time, the kingdom of God is breaking into the kingdom of darkness. We have to take it by force. We're fighting for every soul. There will come come a time when Jesus comes and sets his, his kingdom up, and he will be on sight. He will be on his throne in Jerusalem, on this earth, and he will be the king reigning on this planet. The devil thought that he wanted, he'd be tempted by just stuff. All the kingdoms of the world, all the splendor, all the stuff. And Jesus wasn't going to the cross for the stuff. The stuff, the lands, the possessions, the kingdoms of this world. The world says, the world, the world thinks this way. If you want to be great, you're going to have a lot of stuff. And if you look at the great rulers of the world, the great l- rulers of nations, they're very rich, men and women, very rich, very wealthy, have a lot of stuff. But Jesus was going to lead another way. Worship the Lord, your God, and serve him only. There's something about that answer that Jesus says, there's something powerful about that because we become what we worship. We become like what we worship. What we adore, what we set our hearts and minds on, that's what we become like. The son said, I'm going to serve. I'm going to be the one that serves. Worship the Lord and serve. The son is in communion with the father, and the father and the son, they are one. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There was a communion there, serving. I I mention that because it's the very character of God. We don't think about that as the character of God. We don't think of God as having the character of humility or being a servant God. But Jesus came. He was the underdog. The position that Jesus would take, king of kings, Lord of lords, Savior of the world. He didn't get that position out of a popularity contest or an election. Jesus wouldn't become the king of kings by taking a leadership class at the junior college. He wouldn't get it that way. Jesus became the king through serving. He served. It's not stuff that leads to significance. It's serving. Jesus wasn't making a kingdom out of buildings and wasn't after fame or fortune. Jesus' kingdom was simply this. It was you and I. He was building a kingdom of people, and he was building a family. Serving leads to significance. Godly power comes through humility. Jesus tried to talk to his disciples, and near the end of his life in Matthew chapter 20, there was a, a, a little, you know, teachable moment. James and John were two of the disciples, and James and John had a mom who was interested in their lives. Moms, any moms here interested in your children's lives? Amen. You should be. But this mom went up to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, sidebar, um, is it possible that my two sons could be on your right and left? 
and, and help when you come into your kingdom? Can they be like, really, they're awesome. You know, you've been with them for a couple years now. And I know they have a lot of potential. And I don't know all that went on in that conversation, but I do know that the other disciples heard about it. And they started in. Well, they're not all that. What about me? I can imagine Peter, you know, like, I walked on water. <laughs> you know. Oh, they had a rift. And Jesus uses it as a teachable moment right when they're at each other's throats. Matthew 20, verse 25. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority or domination over them. In other words, he's saying, the rulership that you've seen modeled in this world is a dominating leadership. It's telling people what to do. It's taking advantage of people. It's being large and in charge. And Jesus says in verse 26, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your what? And whoever wants to be first must be what? Your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus identifies himself at the beginning of his ministry as the servant. And he follows through with it. If you ever think of yourself, I think, what kind of position do I want? What kind of title do I really want to aspire to? And there's nothing wrong with that. But think also, how is it that I can serve God and serve people in that thing that you put in my heart? You want to be influential? You want your life to count? You want to, you want to make a difference? Good. At the core of that, serve God and serve people. God will take care of the position. He'll take care of the title. One last scripture. In Philippians chapter 2, this is a scripture that really reflects Jesus' life. It's one of those life scriptures, and it's one of my favorite ones in the Bible. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 2, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He made himself nothing. He made himself nothing. There's a Greek word that describes that. It means he emptied himself. He emptied himself of his glory. He emptied himself of a lot of his power to come to earth and become the God-man. He emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Church, the greatest act of humility led to the greatest act of exaltation. Jesus, the God-man, became one of us and served us completely, gave his life for us. God gave him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Someone asked me once, well, well what does that mean? Everyone's going to get saved? No, but when Jesus comes back, those people who are in heaven, they're going to for sure acknowledge. Those people that are on earth, they have to, because we're all going to stand before the judgment throne of God. We're all going to stand there. And we have to, no matter if we've, if we've served him or not, we have to declare he is the Lord. And the people on the earth, the people alive at that time, the people under the earth, the people who have died, they're all going to have to say he is the king. If you focus on serving God and people, God will take care of the position. Jesus was the ultimate underdog, the anti-leader. Dependent on the Father, embracing pain, serving his way to be the Savior. 
and he calls us to do the same. The goal is for us as believers in, in, in Jesus is to be conformed and transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're going to be conformed into his image. He wants to make us like him. And so we become dependent. If we want to become strong, we've got to recognize that we're weak. We have to become completely dependent. We have to come to the point where we say, I don't want to go outside today without Jesus. I don't want to go outside. I don't want to get on the freeway for sure without Jesus. But I don't even want to go through this life. I don't, not one day. Not one day without a relationship with God. I need to be completely dependent upon him. I don't mature into a place where I don't need him anymore. Maturity really is greater dependence. Secondly, he wants us to embrace the pain. And I'm sorry, I hate to even say that, but it's true. Embrace the pain. It's not masochism. But it's a process that God is working through in our life. It's a process of pain that he uses to transform us. God makes diamonds, but he's got to use pressure. The process of growing strong, being conformed into his image, maturing through pain. And he wants us to serve, to lay our lives down, to count other people as more important than ourselves. That's real maturity. Dependent on the Father, embracing the pain, serving our way to position. Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you completely surrendered to him? I mean, given it all. It, don't, it only works when you give it all, by the way. If you've said, oh, I kind of, I, I said I was going to follow Jesus, but then you did your thing during the week and you came to church on Sunday, and like, that didn't work out good. That week didn't work out so good. It's just giving him total control. Take my life, take everything, Lord, and use it for your glory. Do what you intended. When I, was, when I was created, you had an intention. Do that, Lord. Submit myself to your process. Would you pray with me, church? Lord, we, we want to thank you, first of all, for what you did, how you showed us. You were the, the forerunner to show us what life was really about. And I, I pray for us today that we would not trust in our own abilities in our own talents. We would not trust in our own finances, in our own strength, but we would trust in you completely and we would depend on you fully. We surrender. <laughs> we surrender it all. Lord, thank you for suffering for our sake. Thank you for standing in our place. And I pray that you would teach us through the suffering that we go through. Not the suffering that we did ourselves, we shot ourselves in our own foot, but just the suffering that we go through in life. Teach us. Make us stronger through the trials that we face. Conform us into your image as we walk through those valleys. And Lord, I pray that you give us your heart, that heart of a servant, that you would indelibly mark us servants of God. Show us what our life is all about as we love you, live for you, and serve you. Now, with your, with your eyes closed just for a second, I'm going to make a, a very simple invitation. I do not know everybody in the room. I know most of you. Um, I don't know where you are with God. I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning to say yes to God where you're saying, I'm no holds barred, I'm all in with Jesus, I'm going to give him complete control of my life. And I'll tell you, that's the only way it really works. And so some of you are going to say, that's me, and you've already done that before. That's okay. It's called a recommitment. That's awesome. Some of you might say, I've never done that before, and I'm ready to start a new life. 
And that's awesome. Here's what God wants to do. He wants to give you life and life abundantly. It's an incredible journey by faith, living with the Son of God in your life, led by the Holy Spirit, honoring the Father. Real life, the way it was intended. If you want that, I want you to do something. I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. That's me. That's me, Lord. I'm all in. Take it. Take my life. I'm not holding anything back. I'm not hiding anything. I don't have a plan B. It's all you, Jesus. No plan B. You see our hearts today, God. You see our hands. We want to love you. We want to live for you. We need your help. Holy Spirit, be our guide. Show us how to live. Be our constant companion. Jesus, make the way. And we pray that everything that we do in word or in deed, we would do it all for your glory. All for your glory. You're good, God. If that's your prayer, say amen, church.